encounter uh, the loss of the individual neuron or the individual network. When we talk about chapter 14, the brain, we're going to talk about electrical impulses moving like waves over the surface of the brain. And because of electromagnetism, we will be able to track the pattern of electrical discharge that's moving sort of like waves on the ocean over the surface of the brain. Those external connections that we make when we um, do an electroencephalogram will give us a measure of that electrical connection. And it's a great black box uh, uh, method. When we discovered EEG and EKG, we basically planted these electrons just to see if we could detect a signal. When we did, we then started hooking up a whole bunch of people that had uh, to all appearances normal brain function to come up with a normal baseline EEG. And then people who had recognizable brain malfunctions or recognizable psychological disorders, we would look at their EEG to see if there was some distortion. In very rare cases, we did see a difference. It was much more uh, productive to hook up an EEG and detect the brain waves at, uh, at rest when you're conscious uh, during exercise. And then what happens when you fall asleep? The brain waves ch change dramatically between shallow sleep, the so-called rapid eye movement or REM sleep, through the transition period to deep sleep. Deep sleep waves are much very, very different. So let's just start with the brain and the cranial nerves. The brain is a part of the central nervous system. The cranial nerves, 1 through 12, are part of the peripheral nervous system, even though they occur in the skull. Brain functions are going to include a whole bunch of uh, relays and connections. Uh, so although we're not following individual electric circuits like we would in a house or a car, uh, connectivity is still important. Break the connection and the nerve impulse stops. Now that may be as simple as a synapse that's too wide or a synapse that's closed down. Those peripheral, those, I'm sorry, those brain impulses are coming into the brain from everywhere in the body. And we are going to process this in the brain. Now, this is where our ongoing monitoring of things like gravity, which way is up, uh, the conditions of the body, the orientation of the body and our posture to be able to stand and walk are all compared with our inputs of the present day. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we tasting and touching and comparing them with our memory and basically making an evaluation through information processing. Is this a normal occurrence? Is this a danger? Do we need to come up with an emergency response or is this something that we simply wait here on the curve until the traffic passes? This is all going on in the brain and uh, due to the basic breakdown of brain regions that we introduce the nervous system with. We're going to see in this PowerPoint the six regions and their general functions that I absolutely want you to know with that first slide. Be able to name the six regions and come up with two to three uh, general functions that occur there. Recognize that the meninges that we established and described over the spinal cord extend through that foramen magnum and completely wrap the brain. So the brain, like the spinal cord, is completely separate physical, physically and chemically from the surrounding blood metabolism that's controlled by the plasma. Within the brain, the minerals are packed so close together, it's not good enough to just try to diffuse oxygen uh, from the cerebrospinal fluid through that dense matter. We're going to have to have ventricles. We're going to have to have channels that hold the cerebrospinal fluid and conduct it through the brain and basically conduct it to a location close to every living cell. The brain anatomy is very complex. We're not going to go into it very deeply. But because it is so interesting, we've studied it very deeply and do have some landmark anatomy for you to understand. Like with the spinal cord, we're going to encounter a blood-brain barrier based on the meningeal separation and a blood-cerebrospinal fluid barrier. 
these are going to be always exchanging material. The blood does deliver the oxygen and the nutrient in the form of glucose to the brain. But in order for that to get to the brain cells, it's got to go through an astrocyte. It's got to be monitored and regulated in its delivery. The cranial nerves are nerves 1 through 12. We'll show you those in a moment. Um, we're also going to see uh, the association of different neuronal areas, white matter and gray matter, into what we call uh, functional areas. <coughs> I've said this often enough that it now deserves a slide, an organizational principle for the nervous system is interconnection, branching, and mixing. So the brain mapping that we have does provide an overview of the kind of the general regions, the anatomy and physiology, and we can make some general statements about what goes on there. But the body evolves as organically. That means cell by cell, tissue by tissue, organs, and they add options by mutation. If those are not negative options, they may be preserved and become a part of our future functioning physiology. So we are going to actually see the nervous system change as the neuron grows new dendrites and makes new connections. That's actually the physical basis of our learning. So you do have some short-term memory where you kind of put it in what I would say is temporary storage here in the prefrontal cortex. But in order to transition that learning into a memory, you have to basically re review it, go over it again, get it correct, get understanding and memory working together, and sleep on it. That's where the neurons grow new connections that become facilitated memories that you can recall at will. Neurons are neurons. They branch and they connect huge numbers of interconnections between cells. Anaxonic neurons in the brain that have no axon, they simply reach out in every direction to provide that uh, synaptic network. A lot of the time when we encounter a nerve in the body, we might say it's primarily sensory or primarily motor, but it, what's really true is that a major body region like this right on, I have to have sensory reporting sending messages this way toward the central nervous system, and I have to have motor messages going the other way, controlling the muscles, glands, and fat. So always a nerve will contain some elements of both sensory and motor. Um, the designations and the anatomy will kind of mention a few names, but we're not going to go deeply into that anatomy. When we look at the brain and the brain stem removed from the skeletal cranium, what we see is a highly folded, convoluted outer surface. This is the left cerebral hemisphere. This is the cerebrum up on top, and it's by far the biggest lobe. And it, from the intact brain and spinal cord, down here below the second biggest lobe, the cerebellum, which occupies the occipital cavity of the skull. On the surface of these, we see deep folds. The fold is called a sulcus if it's very deep. It's called a fissure if it's deep. And sometimes those fissures go very deep and divide uh, major lobes. So this one right here, if you probed in the brain, goes very deep all the way down to a structure we call the corpus callosum and separates out this frontal lobe of the cerebrum from the parietal and temporal below. Here's another fissure. So we see the uh, corresponding to the bones, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal lobe. Now the separation of the occipital lobe is just a little bit less obvious from the fissures. The ridges, the high points that you see undulating back and forth and that the um, pointer is now following, those ridges, high points, are called a gyrus or plural gyri. So this gyrus and sulcus organization is typical of both of the major lobes, the cerebrum and cerebellum. Drawn in profile here is the brain stem Basically, the brain stem ends at the foramen magnum, 
as it passes out, there's no real change in the neuron tissue, but above the foramen magnum, you have the brain stem. Below, you have the spinal cord. And when you pull it out to examine it, you see four regions, starting at the bottom, the medulla oblongata, the pons, which is the part that connects to the cerebellum down below. It's a noticeable bump or swelling in the brain stem. Above that, a short region called the midbrain, and on the very top, the diencephalon. And the term that we associate with the diencephalon is thalamus tissue. We're going to return to that in just a moment. So let's just take a quick trip through these six regions. The medulla oblongata is the only connection of this higher tissue with the peripheral nervous system. So it has to go up and back through the medulla oblongata. That means there's tremendous relay centers, some going to the thalamus, some turning the corner at the pons to go to the cerebellum, but a lot of relay centers, but there's also the development of some autonomic control in the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata has centers for control of heartbeat, for control of respiratory action, and control of digestive systems. It's interesting to me that in the human being, we suffer a decline in neural proficiency with age. So we are accustomed to this loss of mental capacity. That's due to a shrinking of the cerebellum and to a lesser extent, I'm sorry, the cerebrum, Alzheimer's disease, and aging causes a loss of neurons and dendritic cells in the cerebrum, and to, to a lesser extent, a loss of cells in the cerebellum. But this nerve center that we call the brain stem does not decay in that way. So it's more robust as tissue. So autonomic centers and relays. The pons, this is a relay. This is a fork in the road. Sensory information coming up from the bottom that has to do with motor control will turn the corner and go to the cerebellum. It has to do with cerebral action that will go through the pons and up to the midbrain. This is a, a, a center for subconscious and uh, motor control of visceral centers. So a lot of autonomic control, but the one thing I want you to remember for the cerebellum back here in the back is motor programs, motor programs. Motor movement, balance, the things we learn to do. When you were born, you didn't know how to stand up. You learned how to stand up. And now it's like a subroutine that runs automatically. You can do it easily. But it's something that neurons are doing in the cerebellum. It's kind of a body skill, a physical movement memory, if you will, that's occurring here. Now, always we are communicating between the center for conscious thought, the cerebrum, and the center for motor the programs, the cerebellum. So we were in the pons. Going up to the midbrains, we find center for vision and for hearing. We also had uh, some reflexes on the somatic side, controlling the somatic reflexes of the muscle system. And also, uh, oddly enough, a center for consciousness. It turns out that being alert, being awake, is something that the brain actively does. Falling asleep is a different state of consciousness. And the consciousness is maintained here in the midbrain. Now up above, this looks like one big lobe because we're looking at it from the side. If you turned it, so you were looking at the anterior side, would you, you would notice that the brain stem comes up here to the top and the thalamus sticks out to the side in a Y. The diencephalon splits into right and left lobes, the right and left diencephalon. Now, we call this tissue thalamus, and it is tremendous for its relay. That little globe that we call the diencephalon on the right side forms the center that the cerebrum wraps around. So the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobe is going to wrap around it front to back, and from this central opening that separates the right and left hemisphere from medial to lateral and uh, 
from superior around to inferior. So it very much does form the core of the cerebrum on its side. And so messages coming up have to encounter these fanning out, these sensory networks that send messages out to the cerebral cortex. And then once information processing generates a motor response, collects them again and sends them down the brainstem to their appropriate effectors. Now that leaves us with the last lobe, the biggest lobe, the cerebrum, which is our center for thought, for consciousness, for intellect. Your identity is there. You wake up, you know yourself, you know your history, the memories you have from personal experience and the memories you have from actual um, uh, directed learning like anatomy and physiology are stored there. So this is a place for memory. This is a place for conscious and subconscious integration, the somatic voluntary side with the autonomic side. And this is also a vast area up here is contributed to the skeletal muscles and the contractions region by region. So I do want you to know this figure well. Um, we start out with a single squishy cell, the fertilized egg. Through cell division, we produce more cells. Through cell differentiation, we make specialized cells which become different tissues and combine into organs and organ systems. So from the very beginning, we do see a group of cells developing into this kind of lobed cord. At three weeks, the development of the brain is uh, commenced and this uh, is basically cord of neural tissue is developing with this lobed appearance. The proencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon are three recognizable lobes at the anterior end of the spinal cord, the notochord. At six weeks, there's been a further development by cell division and cell differentiation and develops into these additional regions, uh, the metencephalon, the myelencephalon. These are all embryological terms, but uh, basically show you how close we have studied and named. But the importance of this division at six weeks is how they develop. The telencephalon that comes from the proencephalon lobe develops into the cerebrum and forms the lateral ventricles. Now, these are left and right, so we don't number them one and two, but these are the first two ventricles at the very top of the brain. These ventricles basically enclose the diencephalon on each side and allow for, allow for it to be bathed in cerebrospinal fluid. The diencephalon tissue, you'll notice, comes from the proencephalon here. So we used to think it was the top of the brainstem. We now think of the brainstem as medulla oblongata pons and midbrain only, with the tissue of the diencephalon being common to the tissue that's developing into the cerebrum. The diencephalon sits right adjacent to the third ventricle of this region. The mesencephalon develops into the midbrain on the brain stem and forms a cerebral aqueduct that connects the third and fourth ventricles. It's a very narrow tube and it's not a ventricle. Everything with the ventricle is going to have a glandular tissue called the choroid plexus. That's what's going to pump out new cerebrospinal fluid. There's no such thing in the cerebral aqueduct. Down here below this region, the metencephalon becomes the cerebellum and pons. Basically, the fourth ventricle develops from that. Notice a common tissue for the pons in the brainstem and its connected cerebellum. Down below the myelencephalon, develops finally the medulla oblongata and the lower part of the fourth ventricle. Let's take a look at what this single squishy cell, we've kind of taken it through the three week and six week stage. We've named the regions, but let's take a look at how they sort out in a mature brain. The ventricles of the brain are going to produce through the choroid plexus, a constant flow of new cerebrospinal fluid. 
It's going to basically flow through and be distributed around these cavities that we call ventricles. Now, these the position of these is actually embedded. You kind of get the idea. If you look first over here at the anterior view, you can kind of see how this central cavity, the central canal of the spinal cord is continuous with this central canal. Here's the fourth ventricle spanning the medulla oblongata and the pons. Here's the cerebral aqueduct that can, uh, connects the fourth to the third ventricle. And you can see the third ventricle is very much right along the midline, uh, right up along the connection between the left and right hemisphere. Now, these lateral ventricles that look sort of like curling ram's horns basically take a central position and curl through and basically move through all the lobes of the cerebrum on each side. Turn it sideways. Now we can kind of interpret this better. Central canal to the fourth ventricle, to the cerebral aqueduct, to the third ventricle. Notice that although the third ventricle is rather narrow left to right, it is rather extensive front to back and is connected by an intervertebral foramen to the two lateral ventricles. This one on the uh, forward surface uh, the lateral surface being the left lateral ventricle. You notice it has not just a curve. By the way, notice its position. Temporal, parietal, occipital, basically this uh, rear uh, spike penetrates clear back into the occipital lobe on the right side. And then down below, uh, a central position in the uh, tissue of the temporal lobe. So altogether, we have four ventricles, starting with left and right laterals, third and fourth, taking up this position. Now, this is the main uh, production region for the cerebrospinal fluid. But remember, this is encased in uh, meninges. So as it pushes through, there are going to be vents that basically push the um, um, uh, cerebrospinal fluid through smaller and smaller sinuses and eventually into a position to bathe every living cell. Let's look further. Remembering that the brain is encased in meninges, protected both physically and chemically from the blood side of the body. Many layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the, and the uh, pia mater are forming a protective case that's inside the cranial bone, which is the biggest physical protection in the enclosure, and the cerebrospinal fluid. And I want to make a real important point here. Cerebrospinal fluid is not just the chemical regulator here. It's also a hydraulic element that adds cushioning. And the way it does it is this. You can't compress a liquid. It doesn't compress like a gas does. So when you press down on it, the pressure in the liquid goes up and it presses outward on every square micrometer of the internal space. Now, in that way, what that means is I might press down here with my finger, but the increase in pressure is going to take that pressure and distribute it all over the inner surface. So it's a tremendous way of distributing that force so it doesn't penetrate, it doesn't push through the brain membranes. We call this the blood-brain barrier. And once again, in the brain, the astrocytes are the main regulator of, of uh, movement of materials from capillaries, which are throughout the brain, into the spaces, the ventricles and the sinuses that conduct the cerebrospinal fluid. Here's what we look like. We've now taken this brain. We've put it in the cranial case. Here's the cranium. Up here we have the face. Now we notice they've drawn in blood vessels to show that branching blood vessels, uh, arteries, are bringing blood into the brain. Likewise, veins are bringing blood out, but neither of those are porous vessels. It is the capillary beds that are covered with astrocytes. Now, if you take the neural tissue that we've named those six regions out, we notice a strange thing about the dura mater. The dura mater here is represented as a kind of an enclosing, tough, flexible membrane, the big physical separation from the blood side. 
But when you take out this, you notice that the brain, that that dura mater follows the surface of the brain. Do you see this big wall here? And this is one of those sinuses that it contains. Notice they are named when they're major, but they allow for the easy flow of uh, cerebrospinal fluid all the way around every brain lobe. Now, these major folds follow the fissures in the brain surface and sometimes divide the lobes. So the Fox cerebri is a wall between the left hemisphere, which would be on our side, and the right hemisphere, which would be you know, ducking through this hole to this side. This would where the right hemisphere of the cerebrum would be with the temporal, parietal, and even occipital lobe represented. We have another dural fold between this upper cerebrum and the lower cerebellum. This is sort of like the roof on the cerebellum. And back here, finally, the Fox cerebelli that basically produces a dural membrane between the occipital bone and the cerebellum down here in the occipital cavity. Now, if you cross-section this, you can see all of these layers. Here's the protective bone with compact bone blending to a, a spongy bone right here at the top. And here is the dura mater. Notice that it's split into two uh, layers, the endosteal layer and the meningeal layer with a sinus in between another place for cerebrospinal fluid to move. This is the arachnoid mater. Notice how it's mostly space that is created by these cross members, these struts, holding the pia mater separate from the meningeal layer of the dura mater. So creating this space allows for circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. So we do have a kind of a complex and spacious uh, organization of these tissues. The formation and the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid, just to uh, reiterate what I said, we produce them in a ribbon-like uh, structure. Notice this. This is a choroid plexus, and we're looking through into the right lateral ventricle that is right above the right diencephalon and in that lateral ventricle we have a ribbon of tissue on the right side on the left side that has been removed we have a ribbon of tissue as well so those two choroid plexes are up above this connecting uh, tissue now this is white matter going from left to right so-called corpus callosum and this is connective tissue wherever you see this smooth flat surface that means you've cut through and created a smooth surface uh, on the brain, brainstem, or spinal cord. Wherever you see a colored surface or a decoration like this gyrus and sulcus appearance, what you see uh, is a surface of the brain. And notice how that fissure, that central fissure, penetrates from the outer surface all the way down to the surface of this corpus callosum. Now, there is a third set of choroid plexus here in the third ventricle. You can see right below this connection point, and it's basically releasing into a very uh, a ventricle and sinus complex of openings. Down here in the four, here's the cerebral aqueduct, which is basically a flow channel to the fourth ventricle and more choroid plexus. I'll show you another kind of front to back view um, of this in a minute, it might make more sense. Now, the arrows here are meant to uh, indicate potential paths of flow. We're going to crank out a liter, a liter and a half of cerebrospinal fluid every day, and that production is going to push the cerebrospinal fluid all around this space that surrounds the central nervous system. The arrows, uh, as I said, uh, indicate potential paths of flow. As it moves away from the choroid plexus, it is picking up waste. It's getting dirtier and dirtier. It's also delivering any oxygen and nutrient that it has. But as it flows around this upper space, this is showing the arachnoid mater, it reaches a top uh, kind of a position here 
between occipital and, and parietal where there's a penetration from the arachnoid mater out into the dural sinus. This is called an arachnoid granulation. It's like a pressure valve. And so the flowing cerebrospinal fluid that finally has made its circuit around basically be pushed out of this into the dural sinus. Now the dural sinus has capillaries that can absorb that cerebrospinal fluid and conduct it away. Because it is loaded with wastes, the cerebrospinal fluid will be handled as waste and broken down. So this isn't a circulation system. This is a drip through system. We're basically making it here, pushing it all around this general circulation. And by the way, it's the movement that's caused by the, uh, you know, when I move to this side and my brain shifts this way, it basically pushes on the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid acts as a shock absorber, so it doesn't slam against the skull, but it also squeezes the fluid and pushes it around this circuit and out the drain. In this case, the drain is in the top the arachnoid granulation. Biochemically, to understand the isolation, we have to uh, uh, recognize it's very specific to the central nervous system. The blood-brain barrier is created by the endothelial cells of the capillaries having very tight junctions, plus a covering sheath of astrocytes. And together, they regulate the molecular exchange between the cardiovascular flow and the neural tissue of the central nervous system. That blood-brain barrier is a physical and a chemical barrier. The blood-cerebrospinal fluid barrier, where we are conducting cerebrospinal fluid through main, main channels, such as the ventricles or such as the um, uh, central canal, such as the sinuses of the dural folds, this is where the ependymal cells will surround uh, the choroid plexus and regulate uh, the exchange. We only relax that permeability for behind the dura mater. That permeability is very tightly controlled. There's only one exception to that, and that's at the base of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is there at the base, right where the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the uh, frontal lobe are kind of close to each other, there is a region at the base of the diencephalon called the hypothalamus. It is close to the master gland of the body called the pituitary, and the hypothalamus and the pituitary are both involved in the endocrine system, so they are either regulating or producing and releasing the, re the major hormones of the body. And this is one place where regulating the distribution of a hormone, that's going to slow things down. You want it soaked up by capillaries, conducted away with the flowing blood as fast as possible. So they're around the pituitary especially and around the hypothalamus. You have areas where you have not only a relaxation of that astrocyte and um, tight junction structure, but you actually have a variation in the capillary structure so special super porous capillaries called fenestrated capillaries or sinusoid capillaries are actually able to suck that hormone up and get it into the bloodstream directly. Let's start again at the bottom. The medulla oblongata, we said, was full of relays and vital centers of regulation for the basic body functions. So in this case, when we see a region that has a specific function, sometimes there's an anatomical difference. There is, for example, a tube of white matter called the reticular formation that starts in the medulla oblongata and is a, a, a single tube running all the way up to the midbrain. This supplies information to and collects information from centers for cardiovascular, digestive, and respiratory regulation. The reticular formation has also reflex centers that are interacting with the cranial nerves, the cortex of the, of the cerebrum, and the brainstem. So a lot of integration is going on here in the autonomic nuclei. 
cranial nerves that are paired nerves that are attached to parts of the brain stem. On the medulla oblongata, we see the pairs that are 8 through 12, and they have their connection. These relays in the medulla oblongata, sensory information upwards, especially to the thalamus, so that our awareness and our information processing about the body and skeletal muscle contractions is right up to date. And also motor commands descending through that region to go out to the effectors of the body. Above it, the pons links the spinal cord below and the medulla oblongata to the upper central nervous system. The cerebellum is behind the pons and directly connected to it, developed from the same tissue. And above the pons to the midbrain, which leads to the diencephalon and cerebrum. Cranial nerves five through eight are connected at the, region, at the level of the palms, we see a center for respiratory control. And we also see linking of the cerebellum to all regions of the nervous system. Relay tracks in all directions, in this case up and down, but also across or back and forth. Now, I wanted to include this very busy diagram. And in framing it so it would fit on one slide, I've kind of distorted some of the pointers. But let me just point out what I wanted you to see. The color codes is, are the same, the spinal cord. Here's where the foramen magnum would be for the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain, and the diencephalon. From the lateral view, you can see these uh, very fine tube-like connections. These would be spinal nerves uh, of the spinous nerve system if it's below the foramen magnum. Up above, we see the various nerves of the, um, of, I mean, you, you can see it doesn't look much different as you go into the brain case, but we see the nerves that depart for the various uh, nerves from this level, six, seven, eight, nine, and so forth, all the way down to 12. These then are cranial nerve attachments. The medulla oblongata, the pons up here, you'll notice nerve attachment here, here, here. Those are cranial nerves as well. But the main reason for pointing out this diagram is that it does show the lobes and the anatomical regions that we are not going to go into in great detail. But in reading about brain function, the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus here and here on the midbrain, the superior cerebellar peduncle, the middle, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. These are regions of bulges that have been named. This figure, the posterior view, now we're looking at the brain stem and diencephalon from the posterior position outside the, the skull and vertebral column. And what do we see? we see these choroid plexus tissues on the right and left side. These are the first two that we named. The left lateral ventricle and the right lateral ventricle have their a glandular stripe. Down below, we don't see the third ventricle very well. It's more in this position. And it's covered up by tissue that's still intact here. But down below, we see the fourth ventricle. This is the final choroid plexus there, left and right, on the fourth ventricle roof. So that's how the three dimensions of choroid plexus and uh, cerebrospinal fluid production uh, are arranged. We do see named lobes. And of course, the artists are going to color these different colors to give us a really good idea of this pairwise organization of autonomic centers and relay stations. Uh, for example, here is the bottom of the reticular formation, this orange stripe that ducks behind here, and you can see it disappearing up above, crossing the pons and terminating up here at the midbrain. 
You also see named regions like the nucleus cuneatus, nucleus gracilis. Do not worry about these centers. It's, in, it's, it, it's unfortunate we can't spend more time with it. And if you take a course in neurobiology or you are in practice in neurology, you will learn these centers and uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, be part of discovering uh, their total function. The cerebellum, motor programs, bold and caps say it all. Let's just talk about what a motor program is because it is conscious behavior, isn't it? Whether I sit or stand, whether I walk or stand still, those are all things that I can do consciously. But we have to point out that for most of those routine movements and things like balance, body movement, the ability to manage our body and put it exactly into the space we want. Although it's conscious activity, and we can change the activity at any time we want, it is also something that we do without paying much attention. So it's running sort of like a motor program, like a subroutine. So we're just calling the subroutine for balance. I'm not really concentrating on my balance at all when I sit and stand and when I lecture. Um, that means that constantly, because we're up on two legs, balancing on two legs is not that easy. So what does that mean? Our dozens of fine postural muscles are constantly monitoring the stretch receptors in our joints and in our muscles so that their position is received as a sensory message. And in addition, up here from the inner ear, we're receiving a message about the direction of gravity so we know which way is up. It can put those together into literally instantaneous adjustments of those little bitty postural muscles. The secret in posture, keep the weight on the bones. That means keep the vertebra stacked up. So you're walking along, your foot goes in a hole, it throws your balance off to the right. Immediately, your motor programs compensate to catch you if possible to keep you from falling and to readjust you back into that upright stance that represents good distribution of your weight and muscular activity. Um, the cerebellum is constantly fine-tuning these movements. So the motor commands that are coming in from the various parts of the brain, the cortex of the brain, the basal nuclei, and the brain stem that have the proprioceptive or position information uh, of the body, all of those are coming in, and it is the cerebellum that is going, okay, here's how they fit together, and here's what I need to do. Now, this is an amazing slide. I think the most amazing thing from this text and the, uh, uh, is how much the cerebellum looks like hamburger. Doesn't that just look like a relatively sculpted and symmetrical blob of hamburger. That looks like ground round to me. But like the cerebrum above it, it basically is a folded, regularly, repeatedly folded surface that is organized around a core of white matter. Now this midline section shows you that core of white matter and it radiates out sort of like the branches of a tree or the branches of a bush. That's why it's called the arbor vita, the tree of life. And this core of white matter is the fast communication signal that's delivering this information to the gray matter that's on the surface. You'll notice that the surface is wrinkled by the surface gyri, not gyri, sulcus, and by the deep fissures that penetrate deep down into this structure. The gray matter follows the surface everywhere it goes, and that's true all over the surface of this cerebellum. Also located here, and right out here at one of these areas of the anterior lobe, they show an excellent preparation of the so-called Purkinje cells. Now, these are the cells in the cerebellum that are said to develop at times 200,000 synapses with surrounding cells. So those cells acting together and basing their nerve discharges on the history and the body memory of what balance and body position looks and feels like. 
will maintain our physical movement um, on a subroutine basis. The midbrain above the pons uh, regulates auditory and visual uh, reflexes. We do see centers of gray matter here. And gray matter, you remember, is receiving the information from our visual and auditory centers and processing it and initiating reflex responses. Now, reflexes, we, we think about a reflex like kicking our knee or like jerking our hand back from a hot skillet, but there are so many other things that are reflexes. So with our eyes, blinking our eyes is a reflex. Iris contraction in bright light is a reflex. Head jerking to a physical movement, a bumblebee flies in like this and your automatic response is kind of whoop, to jerk back. And those are the, the reflexes coordinated in the midbrain. Cranial nerves three and four are attached to the midbrain as well. So here in this midbrain region, uh, red nucleus, substantia nigra, all colored up nicely and striped. Look at the fluting here on the cerebral peduncle. Here is the top of that reticular formation. See how it penetrates into the midbrain. And here, right here in the back, this is a posterior view, very important here. This is where the thalamus tissue of the diencephalon forms the pineal gland. This pineal gland is right on the midline, a, si a single gland um, at the posterior part of the brain. But regardless of what the artists do in these, uh, these best efforts, when you look at a transverse section at the level of the midbrain, you basically have some external for uh, features. Here's the folding of the cerebellum over here. Here is the white matter that is revealed when you cut across it, and the external features like the cerebral peduncle and the substantia nigra. The diencephalon, it's there to relay and to integrate. Sensory information and motor output are crossing each other here because communicating all of that sensory information to the cerebrum and taking all of that motor output back is a big function of the diencephalon. We call this tissue thalamus and originally the anatomist just said, well, there's a roof and there's a central body and there's a floor. The roof we're going to call the epithalamus. It has the pineal gland. By the way, the pineal gland's hormone is melatonin, a commonly available sleep aid. And although it's generally associated with sleep in the way we apply it, it actually has a deeper function, something we call circadian rhythms, establishing a pattern of wakefulness and sleep, of activity and rest in the body. The left and right thalamus establish the core of the left and right cerebrum, and they're the final relay up into the cerebrum and the final collector back from the cerebrum. The central part of the diencephalon is basically organized in a kind of a lobe that mirrors the overall shape of the cerebrum and therefore relays out, kind of come in a very logical pattern from that central thalamus tissue. Down at the bottom of the diencephalon, you have a region that's called the hypothalamus, which means beneath the thalamus, basically just the floor. It's not distinguished by any particular fold or lobe or fluting. It just looks like an ordinary continuation of the thalamus tissue that's above. But this is one place where the sameness is really deceptive. Before the thalamus is called the hypothalamus, this is the center of nuclei, subconscious control of skeletal muscles, but also control of autonomic functions, because this is the region that connects the neural tissue of the brain to through neural tissue of the pituitary gland, the principal gland of the endocrine system. So the major effector of endocrine activity is the pituitary gland. Its main job would be to receive information from the hypothalamus and release a hormone that's going to regulate another gland. So there's thyroid regulating hormone that comes from our pituitary. There's adrenal regulating hormone. 
that comes from our pituitary. Um, this coordination of our major overall regulatory system, the fast signaling of the um, fast signaling of the neural system, and the somewhat slower, I don't want to say slow, not at all, because I know when I have an endocrine kick, I'm recognizing things like faster heartbeat, uh, more muscular quickness, faster respiratory rate. Within 30 seconds, that's not slow for a whole body response. But it, you have to admit, it's not fat, as fast as nerve transmission. So here we see the thalamus diagrammed in its appropriate position under the temporal lobe at the core of this left hemisphere. And these groups of cells basically correspond to their cerebral counterparts in the surrounding tissue. When we look at the real brain, we rely on these kinds of figures. Look at this, the thalamus on the right side here. This is the inner thalamic adhesion, basically tissue that connects the right and left thalamus together. Basically, this is the right ventricle up above it, and below it, the hypothalamus. There it is. Doesn't look special, does it? But look at its proximity to the pituitary gland, this lobe that hangs down into the cella tersica, the Turkish saddle, the sphenoid bone. Notice that the pituitary gland is clearly artistically separated into two distinct lobes, the anterior and posterior lobes. There are connections and conducting tubules running from the organizing information or the organizing uh, nuclei above it. These are autonomic centers for parasympathetic stimulation. Here is an autonomic center for sympathetic stimulation. And the, what those amount to, you remember, they're clear down there under autonomic function. Sympathetic stimulation is that of the whole body. So what you're going to want to do as quickly as possible, is you're going to up the activity that you find in the muscles, in the heart, in the lungs, the acuity of vision. At the same time, you divert resources away from things like digestion and urination and reproduction. So it's a coordinated effort, and that's what makes it a sympathetic center. We have other anatomical regions, but basically we have to recognize that there are hormones produced in the hypothalamus that move through these tubules to the posterior. The production in the anterior pituitary is located there by glandular cells, and signals from the hypothalamus cause the release of the specific hormone. Now, to relate that to the brain itself, here's a midline dissection. You can see the blood vessels and their um, uh, membrane suspenders that hold them in place. Here is the cut corpus callosum, the connecting white matter. And we can just get a little glimpse. This is the lower part of the right lateral ventricle. Over here, the anterior commissure, and down here, we see the hypothalamus region right down here and the connection to the optic chiasma. This is where the pituitary is going to hang. Now, obviously we've named all the, the large parts, but when we go around and try to figure out what happens where, there's so many characteristics. There's simple reflex response to pain, but there's also complex things like learning and memory and personality that we attribute to the brain. How are we organizing this? And this is where functional groupings come in. So various regions of the brain that may be, uh, uh, you know, spatially, may be separated. They may be in different lobes, are organized to act together. And this is. Uh, the kind of uh, limbic system is kind of a model, a poster child for a functional grouping that involves the cerebrum and the diencephalon and encompasses a lot of diverse functions. There's a complex anatomy, and we know the limbic system is a central system with lots of connections. And that means it's organized to receive input and deliver output to many different regions of the central nervous system.
it does have an uh, an involvement in emotional states as well as what I would call our intellectual function. Intellectual function is learning a fact, remembering a memory, applying a formula. And the limbic system also has to be intact for us to uh, store, uh, form, store, and retrieve new memories. Now, what does that mean? Why is the limbic system important? Well, when we think about our daily activities, there's the ability to do something. So let's say that the, um, the task is working an algebra problem. Do we have the training and the knowledge that we can recall to apply it to that equation and solve for the unknown? That's the intellectual side. But whether or not we do it, you know, it's not whether we can or can't. That's not the whole question. Do we want to and will we go ahead and do it? That's the emotional or motivational part. And the limbic system is one that connects these two sides. When we looked at cuts of the brain, we kind of noticed this sweep, the single gyrus that starts here near the pituitary hypothalamus region, but at the base, really interior to the frontal lobe, sweeps across the frontal lobe to that first fissure, the cross the parietal lobe, touches on the occipital lobe, and then ducks here under the temporal lobe. Notice how this cingulate gyrus, this green region, consists of brain tissue that is surface, but penetrating in, containing other anatomical regions like the hippocampus here. But it sweeps across all the lobes of the brain. That means input from all lobes. Uh, the areas of the limbic system might be worth remembering. You can kind of see a 3D here in the brain that's not split, split. Look at this cingulate gyrus going all the way around the hippocampus and the um, parahippocampal gyrus, uh, the mammillary body and the fornix are all connecting tissues that are attributed to the limbic system because they're central here. They're right around the diencephalon. They're right around this space of the central fissure. Um, they basically receive input from all this central region of the brain. Here's the olfactory tract feeding into uh, the brain itself. Here's the amygdaloid body or the amygdala, it's sometimes called another region that spans. And although it's covered ye colored yellow, red, and purple, this is a white and gray matter. So the limbic system, big lesson, linking intellect and emotion, linking, linking capability with motivation. The cerebrum is the last lobe in the center of a lot of processing and a lot of consciousness. The cortex is wrinkled. And I want to point out when you're first born, the cortex of the brain is wavy. Not what you'd call convoluted, not what you'd call really folded. Those folds develop with the addition of gray matter on the surface and the addition of surface area by folding. So you get a, these gyrus ribs that are uh, separated from adjacent gyri by the sulcus or fissure folding. And again, surface area. We looked at that on the organelle level, on the cell level, the plasma membrane on the tissue level, organ level, and now here on the whole organ, the folding of the brain surface. We do see gray matter on the cerebral cortex, just like we saw a gray matter on the outer layer of the cerebellum. And um, we do see gray matter in other places, like the basal nuclei, where a lot of information processing will occur. White matter this fast transmission due to the myelination of the axons, that's going to form the rapid relays to take a, a message from one place to another place far distance in the minimum possible time. And gray matter that are going to be the processing area where this information is broken down, combined with information from various regions, so basically calling up a synthesis or a response, whether it be a conscious response like running away or 
autonomic response are like standing up in balance. Many, many views of the brain can be drawn, and this one shows the breakdown of the basic lobes, which correspond to the breakdown of the brain bone plates, or the uh, cranial plates uh, that we named earlier. We notice that some of these uh, gyrus uh, and uh, sulcus organization that looks so apparent on the on the um, surface are really a very deep division. So that's enhanced here. If you take this lateral sulcus and retract it, you'll notice that it goes deep inside. What you're looking at where the pointer is right now is actually a surface on the side of the frontal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. And so this goes in sort of like a T and splits in both directions. This is called the insula, a very deep fold in the surface of the brain, and it's right within here, but concealed in view. We're going to see later that several important functional areas in there, including the processing area for taste and for um, smell. Now, this fissure across here, called the central sulcus, divides the frontal from the parietal lobe. And I want you to point, I want to point at the anatomy here. The one right in front of that sulcus is called the precentral gyrus, and right behind the postcentral gyrus, because we're going to divide some of our processing uh, to primary and secondary areas. So moving on, talking about those functional areas, what can we do to map general functions to the cerebrum? And here we've reproduced the cerebrum very well in this upper diagram with kind of color codes. But do you notice how this red frontal lobe goes from a kind of a flesh color to a definite pink to a red? That's because this primary gyrus right here, this primary motor cortex, is the precentral gyrus. This is where motor commands are finalized and sent out. The secondary uh, uh, somatic motor processing occurs right here in this intermediate level, the premotor cortex. And in front, this prefrontal cortex is conscious thought, awareness, early memory storage, and other functions of conscious intellect. Back here in the parietal lobe, shown in blue, we do have this postcentral gyrus. This is the primary sensory cortex. So this is where the final interpretation of sensory information uh, is organized. Um, other things that occur in the parietal lobe, somatic sensory association areas. So a lot of those sensory messages are processed here before they are um, dis, uh, basically communicated as messages to other areas of the brain. Now, you can imagine for the brain, here is where our input is occurring in the blue region. Here's where our output goes. So we're communicating with effectors like muscle glands or fat are going to come out of the frontal lobe. Back here, the occipital lobe is especially noted for its role in vision. And the vision association area is this general area here where nerve impulse, impulses from retinal cells are put together into uh, the interpretation of images. And right here, the visual cortex, all the way on the back of the occipital lobe. So although the orbit and the eye are positioned about here, the optic nerve has to go across and through the brain and deliver that image to the surface area of the occipital lobe, clear here in the back. The temporal lobe remains. You can see when we retract with retractors and open up this insula, we get an olfactory cortex. This is where, this is the temporal lobe, and this is actually the edge, not the base. The edge right here on the temporal lobe where we interpret smell. And the gustatory cortex here on the side of the um, of the uh, frontal lobe, extending around up here where we interpret taste. Finally, hearing is this yellow area. It's actually placed fairly logically. Our ear is right there over the temporal lobe. 
In the skull, the external and internal auditory meatus provides the channel that holds the sensory organs. So interpreting it on the temporal lobe right here makes a lot of sense. Um, we generally divide the hemispheres, but there is variation among individuals. The last hemisphere generally has interpretive areas and speech centers. Prefrontal cortex is involved in our consciousness and what we are aware that we call our thinking. That's occurring right up here. Now, I, I, I want to just reference this because a, a German physiologist named Rodman studied the actual histology of all these tissues in great microscopic detail. And his discovery was that there were recognizable and predictable changes in cell organization and tissue expression over the surface of the brain. He came up with 47 Rodman areas, which are mapped here. And so when a cell between six and four changes, in its appearance, you think, well, maybe that indicates a change in function. Broadman areas have been uh, useful in the definition of some functions, but certainly not all. So it is a useful addition, but not a final word on brain and brain function in the cerebral. So we do have here this lateralization. And that's definitely a part of our brain. We have a left and right side. We have a left and right eye. We also have a left and right brain. And one feature of the brain organization, which we're going to see again and again, chapter 15, 16 is going to show you this very clearly, the thing called crossing over. So you'll notice that the optic nerve from the left eye comes back here. And a portion of the image from the left eye is transferred over to the right side. Actually, back here on the right side, we are composing the image because that occipital lobe is red. It indicates that the source is the red portion of the field of view. So from both the left and right eye, we're receiving an image of the left side of our visual field. And by comparing them, we get a sense of distance away. The right side shown in blue, you'll notice it's being received on both sides by the right and left eye, but it's mixed and matched to end up back here, the left cerebral hem uh, cortex on the occipital lobe is what is interpreting the right side of your vision. And this is something we're going to see in the transmission of, of uh, sensory and motor signals again and again. Now, what sense does that make? Well, I, I kind of don't know how to explain it. There are some things that develop over a long co course and basically start with just a few cells. And those few cells are organized in a certain way. Once that organization is there, it generally is continued as long as it works and especially if it works well. So whether or not we're reporting to the left side or right side could have been the result of an accident or even a behavioral trait in a in a pre-animal life form long before we had a thing that we would have called an animal we may have set the basic pattern for nerve transmission through notochord that leaves us with one brief topic in this chapter and the topic is cranial nerves i'm going to go ahead and just wrap this up there are 12 pairs that emerge from the brain stem. We use a capital N in our slide notation. I notice more and more they are deleting that and just using the Roman numeral I for one through XII for 12. They basically are associated in large part with the innervation of the head, face, and neck, the skin, and muscles of those regions, all but one. Vagus nerve, nerve 10 comes down through the neck, through the thorax, abdomen, and into the pelvis with connections all along. Vagus means wanderer, and it certainly does. It's very unusual. Cranial nerves are the principal nerves of our special senses, so seeing, hearing, um, balance, smell, and taste, all are uh, connected to the brain through cranial nerves. So here we see the underside of the brain, an inferior view, with the brain stem shown here, spinal cord probably down here, and the 
designation of the cranial nerves on the underside of the brain. Now, we start here with number one. This tract is the olfactory bulb. This is going to uh, transmit uh, uh, impulses uh, of odors that become our sense of smell. This tract actually is unusual because it doesn't attach to the brainstem. It ducks straight into the frontal lobe. The optic nerve is shown in cut form here. And after that, the uh, oculomotor nerve. Now, what do you suppose that would mean? Oculo means eye region, ocular, and motor means motor control. So these are nerves that control the motor movement of the eye. The trochlear nerve, the trigeminal nerve, the abducens nerve, and their departure and connections continue. Here is the vagus nerve connected here, the medulla oblongata, with the hypoglossal, the nerve for under the tongue, and the accessory nerve. Now, I'm not going to cover each of these nerves in detail. I'm just going to use one, the unusual one, the olfactory one, to observe because of the great anatomy that's shown in this figure. Here is the frontal lobe and running along its base of the olfactory tract and the olfactory bulb with processes that extend down through the holes in the cribriform plate and hang in a fluid and gel-like suspension into the airway of the nasal cavity. Now here we see the, um, the uh, nasal concha. These two are uh, bone markings on the superior, oh, oh, I'm sorry, on the ethmoid bone. This is the inferior nasal concha, that bone of its own. Its job is to make the air tumble. As it tumbles, this air goes through these dendrites and specific chemoreactions fire nerves. Those become our sense of smell. So I want you to return to this figure. Begin your study of chapter 14 with the six regions and the general functions and then extend it to the more involved descriptions that we made of brain and brain function. We are continuing to develop and elucidate brain function on an ongoing basis, a very active uh, area of research and one that will yield wonderful results uh, in the near future.